kind of a family here. So Nick was uh, our most famous son. And um, because of his involvement with politics and journalism, then he, um, he would bring a lot of events that happened at the bar. He'd write about them in his columns. And, and people really liked that. And he, and he liked that. Our guest analyst tonight is Nick Optimar, who's come down here to represent the uh, Montreal team. Yes. Uh, thank you, Les. Uh, we're here. We're really, really happy to be here to represent uh, Canada and Quebec at uh, this great tournament with a lot of great sportsmen. He, uh, he was the ambassador for Montreal. He was the tour guide. He, he, was, all, he was the knowledge of this city. He, he, had, he knew everything about everything you wanted to know about the city. And, and, he, was, um, and he stood up for the city and wanted, wanted to make it better, a better place. Hey, how are you? How are you doing, Mr. Zemke? How's it going? In Westmount, yeah. yeah. We in Westmount, or I guess we're well, in St. Well, where, where are you living? Uh, McGregor. Oh, McGregor, you're in St. Louis, uh, unfortunately. Our candidate there is uh, Mayor Vertui Williams. Uh, okay. Okay? Good luck to you. Thank you. Uh, no, thank you. No. no, I don't like you. You don't like me? Well, of course not. Your views, no more. No, no thank no you. Views, sir. I know your views. I read the newspapers, all oh. newspapers, including oh. the French ones. Uh-huh. Well, and bilingual. What the hell is he calling a communist for? I said, I get all fired up. I said, I'm not doing my job. Yeah. Good evening. Hi, would you like to speak to Nick Osmar, candidate for West Ham? Amazingly, the Gazette in 1965, 6, whatever year it was, had very few people who spoke French. And Nick spoke French, and he was a lefty, and he hung around with people who, you know, attended demonstrations, and he would say to the Gazette guys, hey, you know, there's going to be a big demonstration tomorrow night, and, like, they're really gearing up for it, and they've got the unions and this and that, and the guys at the Gazette would say, how do you know? And he'd say, well, I know, just, you know, trust me, um, you know, I'll go cover it, but you should have a photographer and this and that, and then it would turn out the way he said. He was very much uh, engagé. He was very much uh, involved in the politics uh, and life of the time um, in, in every possible way. Um, and the thing about Nick, though, there was not a mean bone in his body. Mm -hmm. um, that when it actually came down to acts of violence, he really had, he really wanted nothing to do with. Um, you know, when the War Measures Act came down, Nick was one of the first people swept up and, uh, and put in jail as he was brought into the cell at, at Parthenay. Uh, he was pretending that he knew none of these people. They could, they, 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 you know, nothing on him and. Uh, and there was a voice that came from one of the cells, Michel Chartres, the labor leader, said, who's that? And, uh, and he said, oh, it's Nick Oftemar. He said, Nick, Nick, bonjour, Nick, salut! <laughs> Great to have you here, Nick. 1970, he's thrown in jail. In 1974, he's running for city council. He was running convinced there was no possibility of winning because if he win, if he won, he would have to leave his job at the CBC and, uh, and take a huge cut in salary. And much to his great consternation, uh, he won his election in 1974, elected this city council under the Montreal Citizens Movement banner. And uh, it was a great thing for the city, but a very very bad thing for Nick. He actually took a huge salary. We don't thing. want to be isolated from the majority of this province because we feel very compatible and very happy with the majority of this province. And we want to work with the majority in this province. And we don't want to let any political party force us into isolation for their political gain. Every city has its character. You know? I think he was, well, he was a raconteur. He loved the story. You know, if he was discussing, he he would sometimes talk talk over what he was going to write when, when he had the column, and he'd say, you know, I think you're writing about this, but it's boring, or that's boring. Do you know anything interesting about this? Nah, that's boring. And he had kind of a sense of what was interesting. You know, and I'm an English Canadian, and I live in Montreal. And this is like where I was born, and and I feel threatened. Now, I, do I have a legitimate, com, you know, yes, fear of being being threatened because yeah. of my language? You can't put it up on signs or something. That. I mean, Absolutely. I I feel I yeah. feel a, 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 a large part of threat. And the other thing now, is that the, ar the na no, but the argument, the nationalist argument is, oh well, in North America, you know, you're 250 million and you're not threatened. But you know, when when nationalists tell me your language is not threatened, at least in North American terms. That's what you know, where I say, well, you can move to Toronto. That's the same sort of thing of me telling you, well, you can move to France. When you saw Nick, he, 
gave a big smile. Really? If he liked you, you got even if he didn't like you, I think. I don't know. You got a, you got this big smile. And you know, you always felt good always seeing him. He would sit with the old Montreal Star, not the old Montreal Gazette, and he would he would find a column that he wanted to read and then he would fold it like this. Like this, and like that. And he'd read it, and then he'd go like this, and oh, yeah, he, yeah, and he would study the whole paper, and he'd read every bit of it. And he remembered an awful lot of it, and he used it in yeah, his columns. Things. He used it in whatever speeches he could make. You know, he would make speeches in bar and bar. He would make speeches in his political life. He would, you know, he he wanted to he wanted to talk to people. He wanted to listen to people. He would listen. To, you know, he would listen. It's very fascinating. I have to start work, worrying about making a living now. And journalism is the thing I know how to do best. I'm so glad. It's a, it's a win, I think, for Quebec. Well, we didn't really win this. Well, you won in your riding, which I think is most important. No, actually, I didn't. Well, almost. <laughs> I think you've done a great job. Put it on a good very nice video. You're the king. Yeah, he used to say that uh, he thought his name was on the bathroom walls of newspapers all over the world for a good time in Montreal called Nick. And, you know, we'd come here to Winnie's and there'd be some guy from the New York Times and some guy from the Helsinki Helsinkian and some guy from California and they would all be looking up Nick. And I, a lot of that started because... During the Olympics, he wrote a book called The Billion Dollar Game. It's, the mayor has this, uh, you know, he has this uh, feeling of, uh, he likes grandeur and prestige, and the mayor um, uh, wants somebody who can build pyramids. He doesn't want people who can build anything mundane or ordinary. And so he has his pyramid builder, Roger Tiber. They called himself the, uh, the Red Adair of the Olympic movement, that wherever the flame sort of would burst out, he would be the first one in to quench it. At one point, uh, the Los Angeles City Council uh, was debating whether they should hold the games or not. And uh, they flew Nick in, and he basically laid out, uh, not that they should not have the games, but the, the conditions they should set. And uh, I think he saved Los Angeles billions of dollars as a result. And he went on the hotline shows, and uh, he, just, uh, he was the flavor of the moment there, and, uh, and he had an impact. And it was interesting to see him have an impact above and beyond Montreal. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of talk of corruption in City Hall now, but those days were, I mean, we're talking about construction companies that got million dollar contracts, and uh, Nick was one of the first people to put his finger on them, and to document them, and to put them in a book. <laughs> of course, you know, the interesting thing was, the wider stage was there for him, you know, he, he ran for uh, the Conservative Party, he was a friend of Brian Mulroney, he ran for the Conservative Party. Um, and Mulroney, you know, regretted very much uh, that he didn't win, but I th think in the, in the end, Mulroney didn't want him in. In, uh, in the government. Uh, I think it was very clear that uh, the last thing that Brian Mulroney wanted was uh, Nick Offtemar biting him in the rear end. No, all I'm promising is, is, is that I would go to Quebec City and do my best to, uh, to be a, a, an effective, good opposition critic, somebody who would put it under scrutiny. I'm not promising to deliver, I can't deliver, I promise to deliver anything except my effort. Nick wanted to really, I think, replicate his parents' marriage, which is his parents couldn't live together, but they stayed married for their entire lives. I think Nick wanted to stay married his entire life to Linda. Um, they had a daughter. You know, he, when she said she wanted a bass guitar, he started asking around, where do I get a bass guitar? I, I didn't know what he asked me for some reason. I didn't know what a bass guitar was. I mean, we, you know, there's a, an enormous charm in what we're talking about here. I mean, he had conceded, you know, that, that uh, cigarettes uh, gave him the cancer that killed him. Uh, he refused to concede what his surgeon told him, that the, well, the cigarettes uh, triggered the cancer. Uh, it was the alcohol that spread it. Mm. And, um, and he just couldn't accept that. He, you know, even after he was diagnosed and was cleared of the cancer, he, he was able to stop smoking, but he wasn't able to stop uh, those lovely lunches. And uh, so that lifestyle will kill you if you keep it up as ferociously and as relentlessly as, uh, as he did. Mm -hmm. But I think he said, uh, you know, I'd rather have life to the full and have it maybe a bit shorter than uh, live it uh, a bit longer or much longer and maybe not have as much fun. Who is to say, who is to, how dare I make any kind of a judgment or, you know, it's very, very tough stuff. I mean, we, we did make a judgment because we, uh, uh, we missed it. 
Are the two solitudes moving further apart again, closer together? What's, what's happening now, Nick? No, I don't think that uh, we're more divisive than we ever have been. I think that uh, we're, whether the social contract is there or not, I think we're moving closer to it. There's a, there is a recognition. I, I see it in English, in English Quebec. For example, where years ago the, we used to fight on the principle that we should be able to have unilingual signs or something like that. I don't think people accept that. We English Quebecers, I think we want to come home one day to find a different front page of a newspaper that we always find when we're on vacation. Every time we come home from vacation, the front page always says the same thing. Expos lose, language de debate continues. <laughs> what he meant to the city of Montreal? A lot of alcohol sales. <laughs> no, he, was, he was a character. He was an original. He was one of the last great Anglo characters in the city. They are few and far between these days. and. Uh, put a smile on everybody's face. He certainly liv he livened up proceedings wherever he went. He was like a classic. I mean, still missed, and we could use him. En terminant, c'est avec tristesse que bien des Montréalais ont appris ce matin la mort du journaliste et politicien Nick Ofdermore. M. Ofdermore, qui n'avait que 55 ans, faisait partie du paysage culturel et politique montréalais depuis plus de 25 ans. On se souviendra de lui comme d'un exemple d'intelligence, d'humour et d'intégrité. Vous savez quand il était dans le bar, parce qu'il venait dans la porte, et les gens étaient tous autour du bar, et vous voyez tous les gens tous jump parce qu'il était pinché leur bum quand il était dans le bar. And if you didn't pinch his, it pinch, if he didn't pinch that person's bum, they were very offended. Mm -hmm. Nick, you forgot me, and he would go back and work. We knew that if Nick came in, then there would be a few people coming to meet him. All of the boys would gather to see what Nick had to say. Yeah, yeah he's doing it. He's doing it about Nick. I know who that is. Who? Uh, <laughs> Nick would be, No, it's like Oprah or Madonna yeah. or Sting. Yeah, Nick. Uh, yeah, it's just Nick. Exactly. Yeah. They should have retired his name. Say where the horse bit me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was kind of Nick's financial advisor. Not that I know that much about finance, but this was because I had heard of stuff like RRSPs and he hadn't. And when I told him about it, he expressed unbelievable you know, great shock. He had no idea this could exist. And um, you know, the idea that the government would help you save money, he thought, this is unbelievable. But then he made me his real sort of advisor, because one day I said to him, Nick, you need a will. And he said, why? You don't need a will. I'm not going to die. So, yeah, I said, you need a will. If you die, you know, somebody has to know what you intend. You know, it could be complicated. So he reached into my pocket, took out a pad, and wrote out a will in favor of his daughter, and said, here, keep that. And in fact, I think I still have it, because it was... Um, outdated by real well later on, but he said, you know, that's it. Okay, you're in charge of my will. Bonjour. Do you speak English? He was a reporter for the Gazette. He just knew everybody, and he, I was a reporter for the CBC, so you inevitably met, we all met, and we all, you know, we all became friendly, and some of these people are, have been my friends for life. Nick, um, certainly for his life, uh, sadly that he died so young, but um, he was definitely a man about town, a boulevardier. Vous percevez vous-même un peu comme un délinquant? Un délinquant? Non, je dis boulevardier. Quelle est la différence? Je ne sais pas, délinquant, c'est un peu pejoratif. Mm. Boulevardier, c'est plus gay, c'est plus fun. <laughs> I came to Montreal uh, in 1967, I had been studying at the École de Beaux-Arts in Quebec City and came down and immediately got into the business of cartooning for several newspapers, freelancing. Uh, and uh, hanging out in the bars, I kept on hearing from people that I had to meet this well-known communist, Nick Oftermar. And uh, of course, people began telling Nick, you've got to meet this crazy cartoonist, Terry Moser, or is he? Well, I think we were both prepared to hate each other because, you know, we just kept hearing about each other and who the hell is this guy. Finally, we did meet and we got drunk together and we became best of friends. I uh, met him uh, with uh, Jake Richler and uh, Mordecai Richler and all that. And then uh, we befriended and uh, we just stayed friends. L'homme au chapeau et au style flamboyant aimait passionnément Montréal et la politique. Il a épousé toutes les tendances. 
au RCM en 74, au GAM en 78 et au Parti civique en 88, après un saut sur la scène fédérale. Alors moi, je suis consistante. C'est les... Pour moi, c'est les partis politiques qui, qui sont inconsistants. Zinek est un parti à lui tout seul, hein? son bureau, son, son organisation. Et dans le fond, comme je le dis, euh, Nick était un homme que tout le monde aimait euh, et qu'on ne pouvait pas détester, même si on pouvait s'opposer politiquement. He kept getting involved in things. Well, he was involved in the original MCM, but then he broke with them, the Montreal Citizens Movement. Uh, you know, he only ran for City Hall on a whim to start with, and it turned out the people who were in these seats had been in them for so long that they forgot that the election actually could involve somebody else running and winning, and that's what he did. So he took, the, he took a seat, uh, which ended up being downtown, And I don't like all the intrigue. I'm indisciplined, but I want to animate a debate. I feel bad in the confines of a party well structured with a political line. For me, we don't need it. In other big cities, in North America, there is no political party like that on the municipal level. I think from, some, from C to C, from communist to conservative, I think I did a cartoon on that, a very funny one actually, but in the end it ended up saying actually who he really is is Mollis' dad. He was also a shit disturber. I mean, he was a wonderful sort of rascal and loved trouble and loved intrigue, and that's why I always drew him with those big teeth, like, like he's really enjoying this with sort of a glint in his eye. Um, so he did it in a very mischievous way, but in the process, made it a lot of fun for a lot of people. And he attracted people. It was, it was like, it just he attracted these interesting people and types, and he took a great interest in them. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, you know, he just he just was sort of become the, the center, the focus of a whole activity that took place downtown Crescent Bishop, but also, you know, communication with City Hall and to a certain extent Quebec City. Nick usually used to sit around here because they had the light run under, under it and uh, he would enjoy reading his paper over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he would sort of eavesdrop on people talking and get into their conversation. That's where we put his, uh, where the table is over here, so where we put his uh, lazy boy and he used to sit over here and, and uh, I guess read his paper and talk to people and all that. Qu'on devrait dire, euh, de, devrait être notre métier, c'est de parler fort quand il faut parler fort, et surtout quand il y a des, beaucoup, beaucoup de gens qui ne parlent pas fort, qui disent rien. Alors ça, c'est euh, une qualité d'un journaliste et d'un politicien. In the process of sobering up, it's inevitable you go through a period of, like, frankly, you go through a very difficult period of trying to adjust to the business. If you can't hang out in the bars anymore, you can't do this, that, or the other. Uh, so I had to sort of just pull back from all of that and just disengage myself to a certain extent. And I think that really troubled Nick. But the interesting thing is later when he became ill and had to quit smoking and that sort of thing, we used to talk on the phone a lot about the business of, uh, of coming to terms with these, uh, these things, alcohol and, and smoking and so on. Towards the end, it, it wasn't sat, I wouldn't say sad time, it was for fatigue, you know, you could see, like, I mean, uh, towards the end, because he loved to be in bars and all that, and uh, we didn't know what to do, because with the, with, with the radio treatment and all that, he was very uncomfortable sitting in chairs and all that. Well, he helped me in, in, in return, because I'm a bar owner and I didn't open the, till two o'clock, I had no kitchen. So uh, I, I would take him to the hospital and we sit there together and all of it. It's, it's a big thing. I mean, even though you, you're tough and all that, uh, when it comes to uh, cancer and, and, you know, like he was in his lungs, then he got into his head and uh, he, need, he needed somebody to be with him. And I had the time and he was a very, very good friend. So uh, we just did it together. I wish a couple of things had happened with Nick, but I think maybe the drinking got in the way or his need to... Uh, Nick was not a journalist so much as he was a storyteller. Uh, and we forgave him certain things. For example, even though I did cartoons on this, his indulgence in writing about his daughter constantly. It's not a very professional thing to do as a journalist, 
but as a storyteller, we forgave him for doing that. Um, so he was a storyteller about the place and time that he was in, and he did it very effectively. Uh, and uh, I wish he'd written a few more books. He kept on saying he was writing another book, but I don't know that he was. Uh, Nick wanted to go to New Orleans, and uh, we were supposed to uh, take the train, go to Chicago, pick up Melissa, she would get on the train and we'll go by train to New Orleans. He couldn't fly at that time because uh, he had a tumor in his, in his head. So we said, okay, we'll do that and we were going to set it up. We had it all set up and we were going to do it. And then he, he got worse and we had to cancel it and all that. So uh, I said, well, after he passed away, I, we had the funeral and all that. I got a New Orleans band and uh, they played for us all the way from the church to Crescent Street and all that and we everybody walked down with them and uh, we had police escort and all that which were the cops were really really good to us and uh, that was the whole story with the New Orleans aspect of it that uh, he loved New Orleans and he wanted to go to uh, Bourbon Street and all that and he never made it. The one thing I did was I went to St. Patrick's Cathedral which where he said he wanted to be to the funeral to take place and he had given them some money for something, and that, so that was sort of his church, to the extent that he had one. And uh, the priest there and I were walking around, and I said, how many seats are here in this building? And he said, you're not implying that you're going to need all of them, are you? And I said, yes. He said, there's 3,000. I'm sure you're not going to need them all. And I said, well, I think we will. And we did need them all. The balconies were filled, there were former mayors, politicians, many women who wanted to say, I knew Nick rather well. Everybody just loved him, everybody uh, reminisced about him and you know, I never seen so many older women, good looking ones that came by, that were never there before. He loved Linda all his life and he, God knows he loved Melissa all his life, but he was a certain way. And I don't know that people can live with people like that. So in some particular cases, if you're not predictable, you create your own way of doing things. Ma mère, elle était toujours en faveur de tout ce qui est paysan, pauvre et catholique. Elle enseignait que au du côté de, 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 des moins forts. Puis uh, ça c'est une, une valeur simple que j'ai j'ai appris d'elle. This explains a lot about Nick. He resented Mickey Mouse. He didn't like Mickey Mouse. He thought Mickey Mouse got too much attention. Why didn't Donald Duck get the attention that Mickey Mouse did? I mean, he would go on about this. This was important to him. He would go on and on, so he began collecting Donald Ducks. Donald Duck became, <laughs> became a hero to Nick. He began collecting clay figures. People would bring back Donald Ducks they found for him in Hong Kong and all over the world. And he had this phenomenal collection of Donald Duck ties. And I got to admit, I've got a wonderful tie at home, yellow tie, that's filled with little Donald Ducks. Uh, and uh, every once in a while, when there's some sort of remembrance about Nick, I wear that tie. La majorité des, 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 des Canadiens français étaient très maltraités et puis étaient très... Euh Leur revendication pour moi était très juste, alors j'ai les appuyé. Alors, plus tard, les, les, les tables ont tourné, puis je, je vois les revendications de la minorité anglaise sont justes, je les appuie. Pour moi, je n'ai rien changé. Je suis en faveur de, 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 de la justice. Now, by that time, he had turned. Nick always said, you know, I used to support the French in their struggle against the English, and now I support the English in their struggle against the French, because I'm in favor of the underdog. And it's just that the underdogs have changed in Quebec. So he was he he was very passionate about all these notions and what should be done. Un jour, j'aimerais exercer un peu de pouvoir, juste pour voir comment c'est, pour voir si vraiment ça corrompt. It's because you are a Montrealer. You view what Montrealers view. You do what Montrealers do. And when Montreal's watching, so are you. Right there in that alley, he um, was peeing in the alley at three in the morning. He got a ticket for, I don't know, public, whatever that would be. And he was going to fight it. 
but then his mother heard about it and said, Nick, don't do that, you're going to embarrass the family. So he had cooked this up with some lawyer friend, and he had to call the lawyer and say, well, I really, I can't, I can't go ahead with this case. And the lawyer said, why? He said, well, my mother won't let me. <laughs> Nick was 50 at the time.